Hi everyone, it's Miss Mann, and we are reading Esperanza's Rising. We're on chapter 9, uh, Las Cigüeras Plums. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. Okay. And chapter 8 finished up that Esperanza and her mama were talking about what they were pr going to pray for. And so uh, mama hugged her. I will pray for you, Esperanza, that you can be strong no matter what happens. As they walked to the bus stop, Isabella recited a list of concerns to Esperanza, sounding exactly as Josefina and Mama had sounded earlier that morning. Put Pepe down first for a nap, and when he falls asleep, lay Lupe down. Otherwise, they will play and never go to sleep. And Lupe will not eat bananas. I know, I know, said Esperanza, repositioning Pepe on her lap, on her hip. Isabel handed her Lupe and climbed the steps of the yellow bus. She found a seat and waved from the window. Esperanza wondered who was more worried, she or Isabel. Esperanza struggled to carry both babies back to the cabin. Thank goodness Isabel had already helped her feed and dress them. She settled them on a blanket on the floor with some tin cups and wood blocks and put the beans in a big pot on the wood stove. Hortensia had prepared them earlier with a big onion and a few cloves of garlic and instructed Esperanza to stir them occasionally and let them on slow heat, adding warm, warm water throughout the day. I wish Abuelita could see me, she thought. She would be so proud. Later, Esperanza looked for something to feed the babies for lunch. A bowl of ripe plums sat on the table. They should be soft enough to eat, she thought. She took several, removed the pit, and mashed them with the fork. Both babies loved them, reaching for more after each spoonful. Esperanza mashed another three plums, and they gobbled every bite. She let them have their fill until they started fussing and reaching for their bottles of milk. Enough of lunch, said Esperanza, cleaning their faces and gratefully thinking that it would be soon nap time. She slowly changed their wet diapers, remembering all of Josefina's and Isabel's instructions. She put Pepe down first with his bottle as directed, and when he fell asleep, she put Lupe next to him. Esperanza lay down too, wondering why she was so tired, and she dozed. She woke up to Lupe's whimpering in an atrocious smell. Brown liquid leaked from her diaper. Esperanza picked her up and carried her out of the room so she wouldn't wake Pepe. She changed her into a dry diaper and rolled the soiled one into a ball and put it by the door until she could take it to the toilets. When she put Lupe back down, Pepe was sitting up in bed with the same condition. She repeated the diaper changing. With both babies clean, she left them in bed and dashed to the toilets to rinse the diapers. Then she ran back to the cabin. A different smell greeted her. The beans! She had forgotten to add more water. When she checked the pot, they appeared to be scorched only on the bottom, so she poured in water and stirred them. The babies cried and never went back to sleep. Both dirtied their diapers again. <clears throat> the wadded pile by the door grew. They must be ill, worried Esperanza. Did they have the flu or was it something they ate? No one else had been sick recently. What had they eaten today? Only their milk and the plums. <gasps> the plums, she groaned. They must have been too hard on their stomachs. What did Rotensia give her when she was a child and was sick? She tried to remember. Rice water. But how did she make it? Esperanza put a pot on the stove and added a cup of rice. When it was done, she let the, she poured off the water and let it cool. She sat on the floor with the babies and fed them teaspoons of rice water all afternoon, counting the minutes until Isabel walked through the door. <clears throat> Excuse me. What happened? said Isabel when she arrived and saw the pile of diapers by the door. They were sick from the plums, said Esperanza, nodding toward the plate still on the table where she had mashed them. Oh, Esperanza, they are too young for raw plums. Everyone knows that plums must be cooked for babies, she said Isabel. Well, I'm not everyone, yelled Esperanza. She dropped her head and put her hands over her face. Pepe crawled onto her lap, making happy, grungling, gurgling noises. She looked at Isabel, already sorry for screaming at her. I didn't mean to yell. It was a long day. I gave them some rice water, and they, they seem to be fine now. Sounding surprised, Isabel said, that was exactly the right thing to do. Isabel nodded and let out a long sigh of relief. That night, no one mentioned the number of rinsed and harong diapers in the wash tub outside the door, or the beans that were obviously burnt, or the pan of rice stuck in the sink. And no one questioned Esperanza when she said that she was exhausted and wanted to go to bed early. 
The grapes had to be finished before the first fall came, fall rains, and had to be picked rapidly or quickly. So now there were no Saturdays or Sundays in the week, just work days. The temperature was still over 90 each day. So soon as Isabel's bus left for school, Esperanza took the babies back to the cabin. She fixed their bottles of milk and let them play while she made the beds. Then she followed Hortensia's instructions for starting dinner before turning to the laundry. She was amazed at the hot, dry air. Do you crochet? Melina asked. I know a little, but only a few stitches, said Esperanza, remembering Abuelita's blanket of zigzag rose that she had been too preoccupied to unpack. Melina laid her sleeping baby girl on the blanket and picked up her needlework. <clears throat> picked up her needlework. Irene cut, cut apart a 50-pound flower sack that was printed with tiny flowers to use for fabric for dresses. Esperanza tickled Pepe and Lupe as they laughed. And they laughed. They adore you, said Melina. They cried yesterday when I watched them for the few minutes it took to, for you to sweep the platform. It is true. Both babies smiled when Esperanza walked into the room, always reaching for her, especially Pepe. <clears throat> Esperanza rubbed Lupe and Pepe's backs, hoping that they would go to sleep soon. But they were restless. They wouldn't settle, even though they had had their bottles. Today is the day of the strike, said Melina. I heard they were going to walk out this morning. Everyone was talking about it last night at the table, said Esperanza. Afonso said he's glad that everyone from our cramp agreed to continue working. He is proud that we won't strike. Irene continued working on the flour sack and shaking her head. So many Mexicans have the revolution still in their blood. I'm sympathetic to those who are striking, but I am sympathetic to those of us who want to keep working. We all want the same things, to eat and feed our children. Esperanza nodded. She had decided that if she and Mama were going to get Abuelita here, they could afford not afford to strike. Not now. Not when they so desperately needed money and a roof over their heads. She worried about how many were, say, how many were saying, if they didn't work, the people from Oklahoma would just happily take their jobs. Then what would they do? A sudden blast of hot wind took the flower sack from Irene's hand and carried it to the fields. The babies sat up, frightened. Another hot blast hit them, but kept on, and when the edges of the blanket blew up, Lupe reached for Esperanza, whining. Irene stood up and pointed to the east. The sky was darkening with amber clouds, and several brown tumbleweeds bounced toward them. A royal of brown loomed over the mountains. The dust storm! <clears throat> Un tormenta de polvo, de polvo, dust storm, hurry, said Irene. That wasn't very enthusiastic, was it? <clears throat> hurry, said Irene. They picked up the babies and ran inside. Irene closed the door and sh began shutting the windows. What's happening? asked Esperanza. A dust storm like nothing you have ever seen before. They are awful, 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 said Maline. What about Mama and Hortensia and the others, Alfonso and Miguel? They are in the fields. <clears throat> they will send trucks for them, said Irene. The dirt, the dirt showered against the cabin, pitting everything in its path. Get away from the window, warned Irene. The dirt and the wind can break the glass. The fine dust swept inside, and they, tr the fine dust seeped inside, and they tried to seal the door by stuffing rags under it. Esperanza couldn't stop thinking about the others. Irene, Melina, and Esperanza sat on the mattress in, front, in the front room trying to calm the babies. There was no relief from the heat in the closed room, and soon the air was hazy. Irene dampened some towels so they could wipe their babies in their own faces. When they talked to one another, they tasted the earth. How long does it last? asked Esperanza. Sometimes hours, said Irene. The wind will stop first, and then the dust. Esperanza heard a meowing from the door. She ran to it and, pushing hard against the wind, opened it a crack. Isabel's kitten, Chiquita, darted in. There was no trace of her orange fur. The cat was powdered brown. The babies finally fell asleep, drowsing from the heavy air. Irene was right. The wind stopped, but the dust still swirled as it propelled by its own power. Irene and Melina left with Melina's baby, covered beneath a blanket, and rushed to their cabin. Esperanza waited, nervously pacing the room and worried about the others. The school bus came first. Isabel bursted into the cabin, crying. 
Mi gata, chiquita. Esperanza hugged her. She is fine. She is fine, but very dirty and hiding under the bed. Are you all right? Yes, said Isabel. We got to sit in the cafeteria all afternoon and play games with erasers on our heads. But I was worried about Chiquita. <clears throat> the door opened again and Mama walked into the cabin, her skin covered with an eerie brown chalkiness and her hair dusted like the cat's fur. Oh, Mama! I'm fine, Mija, she said, coughing. Hortensia and Josefina followed and Isabel put her hands on the cheeks in a worried surprise. In a worried surprise. You, you look like raccoons, she said. All of their faces had circles of pink around their eyes where they had squinted against the dust. The trucks could not find their way to the shed, so we all, all we could do is just sit and wait, said Hortensia. We had hid behind some crates and buried our heads in it, but it didn't help much. Josefina took the babies next door. Mama and Hortensia began washing their arms in the sink and making muddy water. Mama continued to cough. What about Alfonso and Juan and Miguel? asked Esperanza. If the trucks could not get to us, they could not get to the fields. We'll have to wait, said Hortensia, exchanging a worried look with Mama. A few hours later, Juan, Alfonso, and Miguel arrived, their clothes stiff and brown, all of them coughing and clearing their throats every few minutes. Their faces were so encrusted with dirt that they reminded Esperanza of cracked pottery. When the adults all finally sat down at the table, Esperanza asked, what happened with the strike? There was no strike, said Alfonso. We heard that they were all ready and that there were hundreds of them. They had their signs, but the storm hit. The cotton is next to the ground and the fields are now buried in dirt and cannot be picked. Tomorrow, they will have no jobs because of an act of God. What will we do tomorrow? asked Esperanza. The grapes are higher off the ground, said Alfonso. The trunks of the vines are covered, but the fruit was not affected. The grapes are ready and cannot wait. So manana, we will go back to work. The next morning, the sky was blue and calm, and the dust had left the air. It had settled on the world, covering everything like a suede blanket. Everyone who lived at camp shook out the powdery soil, went back to work, and came home again, as if nothing happened. In a week, they finished cutting the grapes, and while they finished packing the grapes, they were ready, already talking about preparing for potatoes. The camp routine repeated itself like a religious. The camp routine repeated itself like a regimented rose in the fields. Very little seemed to change, thought Esperanza, except the needs of the earth and Mama. Mama changed because after the storm, she never stopped coughing. Mama, you're so pale, said Esperanza. Mama carefully walked into the cabin as she were trying to keep her balance and slumped to the chair in the kitchen. Hortensia was bustling behind her. I'm going to make her some chicken soup with lots of garlic. She has to sit down. She had to sit down at work today because she felt faint. But it is no wonder because she's not eating. Look at her. She's lost weight. She's not even been herself since the storm, and that has been a month ago. I think she should go to the doctor. Mama, listen to her, please, pleaded Esperanza. Mama looked at her wearily. <coughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm just tired. I'm not used to the work. And I've told you, doctors are expensive. Irene and Melina are coming over after dinner to crochet, said Esperanza. She thought that would cheer up Mama. You, you sit with them, said Mama. I'm going to lie down until the soup is ready because I have a headache. Then after dinner, I'll go straight to bed and get a good rest. I'll, I'll be fine. She coughed and got up and slowly walked out of the room. Hortensia looked at Esperanza, shaking her head. A few hours later, Esperanza stood over Mama. Your soup is ready, Mama. But she didn't move. Mama, dinner, said Esperanza, reaching for her arm and gently shaking her. Mama's arm was burning. Her cheeks were flushed red, and she wasn't waking. Esperanza felt panic, squeezing her and screamed, Hortensia, Hortensia. The doctor came. He was an American, light and blonde, and he spoke perfect English. He looked very young to be a doctor, said Hortensia. He has come to the camp before and people trust him, said Irene, and there are not many doctors who will come out here. Alfonso Juan and Miguel sat on the front steps waiting. Isabel sat on the mattress, her eyes worried. Esperanza could not sit still. She paced near the bedroom door, trying to hear what was going on inside. When the doctor finally came out, he looked grim. 
He walked over to the table where all the women sat. Esperanza followed him. The doctor signaled for the men and waited until everyone was inside. She has valley fever. What does that mean? asked Esperanza. It is a disease of the lungs that is caused by dust spores. Sometimes when people move into this area that aren't used to the air here, the dust spores get into their lungs and can cause an infection. But we were all in the dust storm, said Alfonso. When you live in the valley, everyone inhales the dust spores at one time and another. Most of the time, the body can overcome the infection. Some people will have no symptoms at all. Some will feel likely like they have a flu for a few days, and others, for whatever reason, cannot fight the infection and get very sick. How sick? asked Hortensia. Esperanza sat down. She may have a fever on and off for weeks, but you must try to keep it down. She will cough and have headaches and joint aches, and she might get a rash. Can we catch it from her, the babies? asked Josefina. No, 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 said the doctor. It isn't contagious. And the babies and young children have probably had a mild form of it already, without you even knowing. Once the body fights off the infection, it doesn't get it again. For those that live here most of their lives, they're naturally immune. It is the hardest on adults who move here and are not accustomed to the agricultural dust. How long until she is well? asked Esperanza. The doctor's face looked tired. He ran his hand through his short blonde hair. There are some medicines she can take, but even then, if she survives, it may take six months for her to get her full strength back. Esperanza felt Alfonso behind her, putting his hand on her shoulders. She felt the blood drain from her face. She wanted to tell the doctor that she could not lose Mama too, that she had already lost Papa and that Abuelita was too far away. Her voice strangled with fear. All she could do was whisper with the doc to the doctor's uncertain words. If she survives? Chapter 10. Las Papas Potatoes Esperanza almost never left Mama's side. She sponged her with the cool water and fed her teaspoons of broth throughout the day. Miguel offered to take over a sweeping job for her, but Esperanza wouldn't let him. Irene and Melina arrived each morning to check on Mama and to make, take the care of the babies. Alfonso and Juan picked up layers of newspaper and cardboard in the bedroom to keep out the November chill, and Isabel drew pictures to hang on the walls because she did not think Mama would like newspaper and looked and was pretty enough for Mama. The doctor came back a few weeks later with more medicine. She's not getting worse, he said, shaking his head, but uh, she's not getting better either. Mama drifted in and out of fitful sleep. Sometimes she called out for Abuelita. Esperanza could barely sit still and often paced around the small room. One morning, Mama said weakly, Esperanza. Esperanza ran to her and took her, her hand. Abuelita's blanket, she whispered. Esperanza pulled her, pulled her valise from under the bed. She had not opened it since before the dust storm and saw that the fine brown powder had even found its way deep inside, it, as it had found its way into Mama's lungs. She lifted out the crocheting that Abuelita had started the night Papa died. It seemed like a lifetime ago. Had it only been a few months? She stretched out the zigzag rows. They reached from one side of Mama's bed to the other, but were only a few hands wide, looking more like a long scarf than the beginnings of a blanket. Esperanza could see Abuelita's hair woven in, and so that all her love and good wishes would go with them forever. She held the crocheting to her face and could still sell, smell the smoke from the fire and the faintest scent of peppermint. Esperanza looked at Mama, breathing uneasily, and her eyes closed. It was clear she needed Abuelita. They both needed her, but what was Esperanza to do? She picked up Mama's limp hand and kissed it. Then she handed the string of zigzag rose to Mama, who clutched it to her chest. What had Abuelita told her when she had given her the bundle of crocheting? And then she remembered. She had said, finish this for me, Esperanza, and promise me you'll take care of Mama. After Mama fell asleep, Esperanza picked up the needlework and began where Abuelita had left off. Would she ever escape this valley she was living in? Which the valley, this valley of Mama being sick? What else did Abuelita say? After she had lived many mountains and valleys that they would be together again. That's what she said. 
She bent over her work intent, and when she, when her hair fell onto her lap, she picked it up and wove it into the blanket. She cried when she thought of the wishes that would go into the blanket forever, because she was wishing that Mama would not die. The blanket grew longer, and Mama grew more pale. Women in the camp brought her extra skeins of yarn, and Esperanza didn't care that they didn't match. Each night when she went to bed, she put the growing blanket back over Mama, covering her in hopeful color. Lately, it seemed Esperanza could not interest Mama in anything. Please, Mama, you must eat more, more soup. Please, Mama, you must drink more juice. Mama, please let me comb your hair. It will make you feel better. But Mama was listless, and Esperanza often found her weeping in silence. It was after it was as if after all her hard work and getting them there and her strong and determined mother that she had given up. The fields frosted over and Mama began to have trouble breathing. The doctor came in with worse news. She should be in the hospital. She's very weak, but more than that, she is depressed and needs nursing around the clock if she doesn't get stronger. It is a county jail, a county hospital, so you won't have, so you would not have to pay except for doctor bills and medis and medicines. Esperanza shook her head no. The hospital is where people go to die. She began to cry. Isabel ran to her cry. Isabel, Isabel began to cry too. Hortensia walked over and folded them both in her arms. No, no, no. She is going to the hospital to get better. Hortensia wrapped Mama in blankets and Alfonso drove them to Kern, Hosp Kern General Hospital in Bakersfield. The nurses would let Esperanza stay with Mama only a few minutes. And then Esperanza kissed her goodbye. And then when Esperanza kissed her goodbye, Mama didn't say a word, but just shut her eyes and drifted off to sleep. Riding home in the truck that evening, Esperanza felt as if she were in a trance. Hortensia, what did the doctor mean when he said Mama that she was depressed? In only a few months, she had lost her husband, her home, her money, and she is separated from her mother. It is a lot of strain on her body to cope with so many emotions in such a short time. Sometimes sadness and worry can make a person sicker. Your mother is a very strong through but through your your mother was very strong through your father's death and her journey here for you. But when she got sick, everything became too much for her. Think of how helpless she must feel. Hortensia took out her handkerchief and blew her nose, too upset to continue. Esperanza felt as if she had failed Mama in some way and wanted to make it up to her. Mama had been strong for her, and now it was her, her, her turn to be strong for Mama. But how? Abuelita, I must write to Abuelita. Hortensia shook her head. I'm sure your uncles are still watching everything that goes in and out of the convent, and probably the post office too. But maybe we can find something going in to... Maybe we can find someone going to Aguas Calientes who can carry a letter. I have to do something, said Esperanza, holding back her tears. Hortensia put her arm around Esperanza. Don't worry, she said. The doctors and nurses know what she needs and will take care, good care of her. And we will take care of one another. Esperanza didn't say what she really thought. That was Mama, that Mama really needed was Abuelita. Because if sadness was making Mama sicker, then maybe some happiness would make her better. She just had to figure a way to get her here. When she got back to camp, she went behind the cabin to pray in front of the wash tub grotto. Someone had knit a shawl and draped it over the lady sh Our Lady's shoulders, and the sweetness of gesture made Esperanza cry. Please, she said through her tears, I promise, Abuelita, I will take care of Mama. Show me how I can help her. The next day, Esperanza pulled a heavy shawl around her shoulders and waited for Miguel to come home from the fields. Abuelita's ankle was probably healed by now, but she hadn't been able to get her money out of the Tia Luisa's bank, and then she would have no money with which to travel. If Esperanza could somehow get money to Abuelita, maybe she could come here sooner. When Miguel jumped off one of the tracks, she called to him. What have I done to deserve this honor, Mirina? he said, smiling and walking towards her. Please, Miguel, no teasing. I need help. I need to work so I can bring Abuelita to Mama. 
He was quiet and Esperanza could tell he was thinking. But what could you do and who would take care of the babies? I could work in the fields or in the sheds and Melina and Irene would have offered to watch Pepe and Lupe. It's only men in the fields right now and you're not old enough to work in the hotel in the sheds. I am tall. I can wear my hair up. They won't know. The problem is the problem is that it's the wrong time of year. They aren't packing anything right now, not until asparagus in the spring. My mother and Josefina are going to cut potato ice for the next three weeks. Maybe you could go with them? But it is just three weeks, said Esperanza. I need more work than that. Anza, if you are good at cutting potato eyes, they will hire you to cut, tie grapes. If you are good at tying grapes, they will hire you for asparagus. That's how it works. If you're good at one thing, they're going to hire you for another. She nodded. Can you tell me one more thing, Miguel? Claro, certainly. What are potato eyes? El Speranza huddled with Josefina, Hortensia, and a small group of women, women waiting for the morning truck to take them to their sheds. Since the driver could only see a few yards ahead, the truck rumbled slowly on the dirt roads. The truck stopped at a big packing shed. It was really, it was a, really one long building with different open air sections, as long as train cars. But cutting potatoes' eyes was really different. Since nothing was being packed, there wasn't the usual activity. Only 20 or so women gathered in the carnivorous shed, sitting in a circle on upturned crates, protecting the, from the wind by only a few stacks of empty boxes. The Mexican supervisor took their names. With all the clothing they were wearing, <clears throat> he barely looked at their faces. Josefina had told Esperanza that if she were a good worker, that the boss would certain would not concern themselves with her age, so she knew that she would have to hard, work very hard. Esperanza copied everything that Hortensia and Josefina did. When the women put hot bricks between their feet to keep their feet warm, like so did she. And when they took off their outer gloves and worked in thin cotton ones, she did the same. Everyone had a metal bin sitting behind them. The field workers brought cold potatoes and filled their bins. Hortensia took a potato and then with a sharp knife, she cut it into chunks around the dimples. She tapped her knife on one of the dimples. This is an eye, she whispered to Hortensia. Leave two eyes in every piece so that there can be two chances for it to take root. When she dropped the chunks of potato into a burlap sack. When the sack was full, the field workers took it away. What do they, where do they take them? She asked Hortensia. To the fields, the potato eyes pieces, they plant them and then the potatoes grow. Esperanza picked up a knife and now she knew where potatoes came from. The women began chatting. Some knew each other from the old camp and one of them was Marta's aunt. Is there any more talk of striking? asked Josefina. They're things are quiet now, but they are still organizing, said Marta's aunt. There is talk of striking in the spring when it's time to pick. We are afraid that there will be problems. If they refuse to work, then we will lose the cabins in the migrant camps. And then where will we live? Or worse, that we'll all be sent back to Mexico. How can they send all of them back? asked Hortensia. Reparation, said Marta's aunt. La Migra, the immigration authorities, round up people who cause problems and check papers. If they're not in order or if they do not happen to have their papers with them, the immigration officers, officials send them back to Mexico. We've heard that they have sent people whose families have lived here for generations, those who are citizens and never even been to Mexico. Esperanza remembered the train at the border and the people being herded onto it. She had been thankful for papers that Abuelita's sisters had arranged. Marta's aunt said, this is also some talk about harming, there is also some talk about harming Mexicans who continue to work. The other women sitting around the table pretended to concentrate on their potatoes, but Esperanza noticed worried glances and raised eyebrows. Then Hortensia cleared her throat and said, <clears throat> are you saying that if we continue to work during the spring, your niece and her friends might harm us? We're praying that that doesn't happen. My husband says we will not join them. We have too many mouths to feed. 
and he has told Marta she cannot stay with us. We can't risk being uh, being asked to leave the camp or losing our jobs because of our knees. Is anyone going to Mexico for La Navidad? Asked another woman, wisely changing the subject. Esperanza kept cutting the potato eyes, listening carefully, hoping someone would be going to Aguas Calientes for Christmas, but no one seemed to be traveling anywhere near there. A worker, a worker refilled Esperanza's metal bin with another loud load of potatoes. The rumbling noise brought back thoughts of what, to what Marta's aunt had said. If it was true that the strikers would threaten people who kept working, they might try to stop her too. Esperanza thought of Mama in the hospital and Abuelita in Mexico and how much depended on her ability to work. If she was lucky enough to have a job in the spring, no one was going to get in her way. A few nights before Christmas, Esperanza helped Isabel make a yarn doll for Silvia while the others went to a camp meeting. Ever since Esperanza had taught Isabel how to make the dolls, it seemed that there was a new one each day, and monas of and monas of every color now sat in the line on their pillows. Sylvia will be surprised, said Isabel. She has never had a doll before. We'll make some clothes for it, too, said Esperanza. What is Christmas like in El Rancho de la... What was Christmas like at El Rancho de las Rosas? Isabel never tired of Esperanza's stories about her previous life. Esperanza stared up at the ceiling, searching her memories. Well, Mama decorated with Advent wreaths and candles, and Papa set up the nativity on a bed of moss in the front hall, and Hortensia cooked for days. They were filled empanadas filled with meat and sweet raisin tamales. You would have loved how Abuelita decorated her gifts. She used dried grapevines and flowers instead of ribbons. On Christmas Eve, the house was always filled with laughter and people calling out, Feliz Navidad! And later, we would go to the Citadel and sat with hundreds of people and held candles during midnight mass. Then we would come home in the middle of the night, still smelling of incense from the church, and drank warm otule de chocolate and opened our gifts. Isabel sucked in her breath and gushed. <gasps> What kind of gifts? I, I can't remember, said Esperanza, braiding the yarn doll's legs. All I remember is being happy. Then she looked around the room as if seeing it for the first time. One of the table legs was uneven and had to be propped up by a piece of wood so it wouldn't jiggle. The walls were patched and peeling. The floor was a wood plank with splintery. And no matter how much you swept, it never looked clean. The dushes were chipped and the blankets frayed, and with no amount of heating could remove all the musty smell. Her other life seemed like a story that she had read in a fairy book long ago. What do you want to do for Christmas this year? asked Isabel. I want Mama to get well. I want to work more. And she stared at her hands and took a deep breath. After three weeks of potato eyes, they were dried and cracked from scratch that had soaked in through the gloves. I want soft hands. What do you want, Isabel? Isabel looked at her with her big doe, blue eye, or big doe eyes and said, That's easy. I want anything. Esperanza nodded and smiled. Admiring the completed doll, she handed it to Isabel, whose eyes, as usual, were excited. They went to bed. Isabel in her cot and Esperanza in the bed that she and Mama had slept in. She turned toward the wall, yearning for the birthdays of her past, and repeated what had come to a nightly ritual of silent tears. She didn't think anyone ever knew that she had cried herself to sleep until she felt Isabel patting her back. Esperanza, don't cry again. We will sleep with you if you want. We? Oui? She turned toward Isabel, who was holding the family of yarn dolls. Esperanza couldn't help but smile and lift the covers, and Isabel slipped in beside her, arranging them dolls between them. Esperanza wanted what she had had, but what she wanted so few me what want bleh. she wanted so few memories. She wanted so few worries that something as simple as a yarn doll would make her happy. On Christmas Day, Esperanza walked up to the front of the hospital while Alfonso waited in the truck. 
she thought of a gift that she had in her pocket. It was nothing more than a small tooth stone that she had found in the fields when she was weeding. The doctor had moved Marta to Mama to award. The doctor had moved Mama to award for people with long-term illness. Mama slept and didn't wake even to try to say hello. Nonetheless, Esperanza sat next to her. She sat next to her and crocheted a few hours on the blanket and told Mamas about stories about camp. Mama didn't wake to any, say goodbye either. Esperanza tucked the blanket around her, hoping that the color from the blanket would slowly seep into Mama's cheeks. She put down the stone. She put the stone on the night table and kissed Mama goodbye. Don't worry, I will take care of everything. I will be la protona for the family now.